That was as nice a thing as I've ever heard. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, I haven't told anybody this, but we're actually going to keep this interview going for about five days. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> one more interview with one more Rolling Stone writer in a car. Yeah, that's right. No, that was uh, as nice a thing as I've ever heard. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, let's start from the very, very beginning. Now, do you remember when David Foster Wallace's name first registered with you? Like, who you knew who he was? If you'd read any of his stuff? Long before this. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing I ever read was an excerpt that was printed from Infinite Jest that was the rise and fall of video chat. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever read that particular, I don't know if anyone's read Infinite Jest as a whole or, or that. I, I'll tell you why I asked the question, because uh, when I bought Infinite Jest for the first time to get ready for this movie, I bought it at a little local bookstore. And there was like a real ghost world kind of girl behind the counter. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, I set it down. And she literally rolled her eyes at me. And then she said, infinite chest. Every guy I've ever slept with has an unread copy on his bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, he, he was a guy who was just so forward seeing about what technology was going to become and these things that were meant to connect us were ultimately going to dehumanize interaction. But that section in particular was about how everyone's so excited when video chat becomes available, but then they have this realization that they can no longer do other things while they're talking to somebody because they right. can see them. And it evolves to people creating elaborate masks and dioramas so that it looks like they're giving full attention until eventually they've taped off the camera uh, and they're back to auditory phone conversations. So that was the first thing that I read. Then a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, which was called Shipping Out at one point. A lot of the short form nonfiction, but I hadn't tried to tackle Infinite Jest. No, it's, the, it's a Mount Everest. It's, it's something that definitely requires time and effort to tackle. Well worth it, I think, but... Oh, I think that by the end, it is the most satisfying experience you can have, and I think that there's something that uh, he tries to remind us that we're capable. You know, you're sort of given this uh, very subtle and sometimes not so subtle message that what you're good at is watching TV. <laughs> that, no, really, like, that what is a good life culturally, is to work really hard so that you can come home and crack open a beer and watch reality TV on a big giant television, and that that should satisfy you. And um, it's no wonder that we feel dissatisfied, I guess. And so my experience with reading Infinite Jest was uh, by the time I finished it, I really felt like, I felt like how you feel after you go for like a long jog. I don't really know what that's like, but... <laughs> <laughs> but from what I've been told, you feel like, oh, I did that. <laughs> so, so prior to going on this long jog, yeah, uh, you're you're sitting at home and a script comes. I was at an airport. Uh huh. I was in an airport flying to Boston. I remember it really distinctly. So. To set up where I was when I got the script, because I think it's an important part of the story, um, I was feeling, uh, I was at a point where uh, it was the last season of my TV show, mm -hmm. and I was also, I was 34 years old, uh, maybe I was 33 when I got the script, uh, and so forgetting Sarah Marshall is really an honest reflection of where I was at 24. You know, that is, I mean, that is really like, I'm really proud of it. That is what I was thinking about. And it is those times when a, a breakup with the girl you think you're going to marry is devastating. The world is ending, you know what I mean? You call it the breakup as though anyone else cares. Like, um, <laughs> A qualifier makes it the whole difference. Doesn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. You know, because that's what it is in your mind. It's like the breakup. Um, but I, what I had found was, I think, by nature of the way the business works, um, by nature of doing big movies, you um, you're encouraged in a lot of different ways to uh, continue to do what has been successful. 
So I did a lot of movies that were sort of in that realm or, or felt that way. And by the time I was 33, I was starting to feel like my interior life wasn't matching up with what I was putting on screen. I was feeling a real pull. And uh, that's not a good feeling when you write your own material and when you, you know, I try to, there's a lot of different types of acting, but I kind of try to um, do a, some version of being a surrogate, like, hey, I'm, I'm you for the next hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Do you feel this way too? So then I put out into the ether like a decision. I wanted to do something different. I needed to make a change. Uh, if I'm going to do this for 50 more years, if I'm lucky, it needs to be stuff that is reflective of how I'm feeling. So anyway, I'm at the airport, and the script arrives, and I read it on the plane. And uh, I thought, this is really cruel to send this to me. <laughs> 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 and I landed and I called my agent and I said, yes, this is the type of material that I'd like to do, but I, you know, maybe someday they'll let me do this kind of stuff. And she said, no, James Ponsol, the director, wants to talk to you about it because he thinks that you might be able to do it. And there was a line in that script that I almost like cried on the airplane, which was uncomfortable because there was, there was a person next to me who was a stranger. Uh, <laughs> You, you've been full frontal naked on screen, but you were uncomfortable <laughs> crying in a plane? Oh, well, I had a bad experience on that. This is a short tangent, I promise. But one time, I think it was due to the altitude, I was watching a movie on the plane, and I started crying, like, really hard. I, I think a good way of putting it is disproportionate to the occasion. <laughs> and uh, the woman next to me looked over at me like, is he OK? And then she like peeked over to look at what I was watching and it was Dream Girls. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyways, I, uh, I started, I talked to James and it was interesting, man. Not since Judd Apatow, when I was 18 years old, have I felt like somebody saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself or I, things that I privately hoped about myself, but I felt like would never be acknowledged, you know? Mm -hmm. And James said, I, uh, in all of your comedy dating back to Freaks and Geeks, I, I thought I saw something very sad behind your eyes. And uh, I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> he found it. People can see that. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I understood what he meant, you know, it wasn't a, wasn't a surprise to me what he was talking about. And um, we, uh, we talked about, I asked him why he thought I could be good at it, and he said, because uh, one of the pitfalls of a movie like this is that um, David Foster Wallace is, becomes deified, and you put him in such a rarefied air that you lose uh, perspective on the, the importance of the man he was, that he was really funny. Yeah. Uh, his writing is, uh, is unbelievably funny. And also that what David Foster Wallace does in his writing, in, from my experience of reading it, and why I think he really resonates with people, and uh, why people do feel some ownership over him, um, to go back to the, some of what you were saying, mm -hmm. uh, is, he is he provides a surrogate experience. He's not talking to you from the other side of a journey. He's right in it with you, saying, hey, I'm in this thing. I am feeling these ways. Does anybody else want to join in this conversation with me? And um, I really related to that idea. It's, it's the same way you feel when you read Catcher in the Rye when you're in high school. Yeah. This feeling of like, hey, that guy's saying what I'm feeling. I'm capable of saying, of screaming, get out of my room. And this guy knows how to write a novel about get out of my room. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's, that's how I felt when I read Infinite Jest. Like, geez, these feelings I'm having of being confused why I don't feel satisfied are now illuminated for me through metaphor, and uh, this, is, this is how I feel. I have words for it now. Um, many, many words. Yeah, a lot of words. 
You know what's so interesting about that to jump around, but I don't want to lose sight of that thing you just said, mm -hmm. many, many words, is that one of the things that really stuck out to me, this is, well, it does tie in. Okay, because James said, you're also a writer. Um, you know, I don't write that kind of stuff, but I have experience writing. So does Jesse. Jesse is a brilliant writer. Um, but one of the things that I know about writing is that it is very, very lonely. Um, you have no reason to think about it unless you write, but every one of those pages is a night where you say, no, I can't meet you for dinner. You know? And so, and, and that's not a small thing. So for me, a screenplay is three months or something, you know, three months, six months, whatever, of saying, no, I can't go do that fun thing. I can't meet you for dinner. Um, Infinite Jest is a thousand plus pages. And that is so many nights of no, I can't meet you for dinner. No, I can't do that fun thing. And that is such a long time to labor that way under the belief that what you're writing is gonna be worth it. It's a huge leap of faith, not to mention a discipline of just like, I'm gonna chase this vision until this vision is caught, but a huge leap of faith that this three and a half pound tome that I'm writing uh, that going anyone's going to care. Much less. That's right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I really identified with that idea. I think that it is a very particular personality of any artist that is, you know, rarely analyzed or talked about. That despite any differences that you have personally, there is a binding personality type, which is that you privately believe that <laughs> what you have to express is worthy of everyone being quiet and paying attention to. <laughs> Right? Yeah, any novelist or artist has that, yeah. Yeah, like I, I walk into a room sometimes <laughs> of people and I say to them essentially, I've thought of an idea on my couch <laughs> and I would like you to give me X amount of dollars to put that on screen because I am also sure that people are going to be very interested in committing a night to sitting down and experiencing this idea that I thought of uh, you know, after my snack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to fixate on the trolls, but yeah. did it surprise you that people, when it was announced that you were going to be playing David Foster Wallace, that people were that proprietary over him and his image and his memory? I mean, I understand yeah. a little bit of cognitive dissonance where they're like, oh, it's the bromance dude and he's going to play this author. Sure. That, you know, people love so much, although, you know, Give a guy a chance. Well, I stopped looking at the internet like three years ago for <laughs> entertainment stuff. Oh, you don't know what you've missed. Yeah, no, I do know what I've missed. Around when I stopped is when I saw things on the side of what I thought were legitimate news um, <laughs> organizations that said like uh, 10 celebrities with fat husbands. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. And I decided that this was not going to make me feel good. And you know what? <laughs> uh, I, no, I'm, I'm being serious. I, I really feel this way. I, uh, I, don't, I feel bad for the celebrity, I suppose, but I feel really bad for the consumer. I feel yeah. really bad for the person who decides I'm going to devote any amount of time to this and click on it and get, get this moment of a rush feeling like, oh, this makes me feel good. And then slowly we... Um, change so that we feel like it's okay to f talk and feel that way and treat people that way and like when they walk out of the room you shame them. I think it's a really terrible thing. Uh, when I stopped looking at the internet and focused on, I, I look at the internet for other stuff like to have Mac rumors, um, like uh, <laughs> you know stuff like that but I stopped investing myself in things that um, like didn't make me feel good about what was immediately happening in my, in my sphere. Like when I focus on what's actually happening, things are really good. And when I extend that to like, I don't know, what did Joe from the reality show say to Vanessa and all this stuff, like I don't, my mind goes someplace, it's a, it's a better use of my time. So that being said, I was fully aware I knew that nobody was going to be a harder judge on my performance than me. That's something after 18 years of doing this I'm painfully aware of. And so I felt like um, the best use of my time was for me to figure out how I was going to proceed unapologetically because I was like very scared. I was super scared when I said yes. 
But you did say yes. Yeah. So once you said yes, what was the process of trying to figure out who this person was? Well, there's the external part where I was aware coming from comedy that one of the pitfalls was that it felt like a sketch or an impression, right? And so I wanted to be really uh, sensitive to the fact that this is a real person who people love and care about in all sorts of varying capacities and you have to honor that and try to be as accurate as possible. But at the same time, I felt like what was the most important thing was to capture the essence. And so, um, my experience with press tours, as I'm doing right now, I'm on a press tour for this movie, and I'm a different person uh, on this press tour than I am on the Muppets press tour. And neither of them is a lie. It's a function of what you're thinking about daily. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not walking around every day thinking about childlike wonder and what's my favorite Muppet song. And <laughs> so I'm in a different mood. Do you know what I mean? And what I felt like was this movie is not a cradle-to-grave biopic. This movie takes place over the last four days of a press tour. And so it occurred to me at one point that what he is thinking about and talking about every day for the past few months are the themes of this book. So it follows that that is what he's actively, that's the front of his brain, that's what's going on. Right. And he's also been writing the book for X number of years, so it's, he's in the middle of that. And so I thought that the best thing to do was to really focus on what I thought the themes of Infinite Jest were and put those at the front of my brain. Um, then, so we can talk about those themes if you want, but the other thing that I thought that really came through is his, how beautifully and profoundly he writes about depression. And there were two passages that stuck out to me. One is he talks about the phenomenon of people jumping out of a burning building. And it begs you to ask the question, what could be so terrifying that jumping out of a building feels like an escape from it? And he's talking about that in, in relation to suicide, right? Uh, and then the other section was a girl is brought into the hospital after a failed suicide attempt and the doctor says, why did you want to hurt yourself? And she says, you'll never understand. You think I wanted to hurt myself. I was trying to end the pain. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what everyone else's experiences are, but I felt like, um, oh, he knows how to say get out of my room in a much prettier way than I do. And um, and so it occurred to me at that point that when you really deal with depression in that sort of deep way, you're, you're never, it's never not there. It's like having a twisted ankle. You know, it's all, you're always aware of it, even when you're sitting. I'm going to have to stand up at some point, you know? And so I just felt like um, there is like a schism between his internal life and what is happening. Like during this conversation, I am actively aware that as soon as we're done, I might regret some things I said. I might feel weird when I get back to the hotel. You're, you're managing those feelings. It's interesting because I don't know if any of you guys have listened to This Is Water, his Kenyan commencement speech, but it's about 10 years later or so, and you feel like he's worked through some of these questions. Some of these questions. Yes. And, and is, is sort of getting close to what he thinks some of the answers might be. And it's um, changing where you place your value. Um, and, and sort of um, taking pride in being a good community member, a good family member, a good friend, and then letting yourself off the hook to some extent. Um, but so the themes of Infinite Jest that I really zeroed in on were in line with how I was feeling when I got the script. That you're sort of told culturally that what is gonna make you feel good is some combination of achievement, pleasure, and entertainment. And you labor in your 20s under the idea that once I get there, I'm gonna feel good. And then in your 30s, you have this really scary realization that maybe there's no there. And that this just goes on forever, and there just keeps moving equidistant away from you. And you, yeah, and you. 
<laughs> no, it's really true. That's where I was. Like I, I have had enough successes at this point that if that was going to do it, it would have done it. You know, that's what I realized. Like I've been dancing up and down the street with the Muppets. Like yeah, I, I did. I dreamed of that. I. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I really did. Like I, I, I dreamed of that. I made it happen in my way. You know, with a lot of help and. And then, it, and then it happened, and I felt really good, but the halo of achievement lasts like a few weeks, and then what's next pops into your mind. Yeah. And, unless you make next now, you know, un unless you make there here. So playing this role, did it change your idea of, of what fame is and your relationship to fame? Yes, completely. Completely. It was the first experience where when they said, that's a wrap, on Jason Siegel, uh, I thought to myself, well, I've done everything that I possibly could. Hmm. And I'm, I haven't been looking through the camera. This whole movie could be out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's a, a lot of different versions of that where, well, who knows? But I did everything I could. I remember. I called my dad right after I finished, and my dad said, how did it go? And I said, well, I did my best. And he said, well, I'm sure you did better than that. And I knew. A nice dad. No, he was saying it in the nicest way, because he was, res he was responding to an old mentality I would have had. A shrug of the shoulder, well, I did the best I could. A defense mechanism, like, mm -hmm. well, you know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I said, no, Dad, I mean it the other way. I mean it the other way. I did the best I could. And he was like, yeah, good for you. Good, you did it. Because that's all you can do. And then you have to, like, then you go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, was this stuff that you discussed with your your book nerd friends, this is your phrase, not mine, yeah. with your book nerd friends, you know, the that club was, that you had? It, this is a good opportunity. It was, that was a phrase that out of context doesn't express the love with which I said it. Like I would say, uh, I am a movie dork, or right. I'm a comic book geek, you know, whatever. Um, they're the smartest, most amazing uh, man that I've had the pleasure of being around. So just to clarify that on my own, because it's haunted me since I said it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it really did, because they, they have so much to do with this performance. Um, we should clarify. There was a, a, oh, I, a I, book I, club that yes. you put together. Correct me if any of this is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of your research, where you and I think three or four other men got together every yeah. Sunday and I didn't even put it together. Through. I'll tell you exactly what happened, because it was like the damn coolest thing ever. I bought the book, and I, I said to this guy behind the counter, I said, hey, have you read this? And he said, uh, yeah. And I said, how, how long should I give myself to read it? And he was like, first time? <laughs> ah, what a show yeah, off. And I said, uh, I, said, I said, yeah, yeah, first time. And he said, uh, he said, oh, all right. Hey, Matt. <clears throat> and then like another guy came out. <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, he wants to know how long to take to read Infinite Jest. And they looked at each other, and it was like an episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. They went, uh, they went book club, book club. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the first Parker Lewis Can't Lose reference since the show went off the air. Yes. Not the last, I'm sure, yeah. but definitely the first. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, Brett, Dylan, and Matt. They sat around with me every Sunday. We would read 100 pages autonomously and then get together on Sundays and talk about what we had just read. And it was the most, um, it was the coolest experience I've had as a grown up. Like, uh, <laughs> um, more so than the Muppets? A grown up started about six months ago. Ah. No. <laughs> no, but Fair so enough. anyway, uh, one of the things that just really stuck out to me is that that book, in reading it, you can talk about the story and the particular plot, because it is, there are parts of it that are tricky to wrap your head around. Like, you can go back and read them over and over again. There are some endnotes that are like minutia about this tennis um, game they've invented that are hard to get through. But what you end up doing is you end up talking about some really central themes about dissatisfaction. 
The book is three-pronged. There is um, recovery in Boston, there's a tennis academy, mm -hmm. and there's an international conspiracy about an entertainment that's so entertaining that it zombifies the viewers. And um, those are the three prongs of his um, sort of thesis, pleasure, achievement, and entertainment. And in all three, people are left dissatisfied. Um, and it just really speaks to how, it speaks to at the time where we were headed as a culture and I think where we, where we are right now, smack dab in the middle of it. I wanna circle back to something really quick uh, because there is a wonderful scene near the end of the film where your character comes into the bedroom where Jesse Eisenberg's character is staying and you specifically mention the part of the book yeah. about, the, um, about the man falling from the skyscraper. Yeah. Uh, there's also a scene earlier in the film that references Wallace's stay at a psychiatric hospital on suicide watch. Yeah. Now, for better or for worse, we know how his story ends. Yeah. The character at that point does not. That's right. He understands there's an undercurrent of darkness that's going on. It's a really important distinction. Yes. Um, but I imagine as an actor, one of the pitfalls of playing somebody who is, for better or for worse, become a very famous suicide, how does that not inform your performance? How do you, like, how do you know when to kind of step back from that? Well, I think that if you play everything as accurately and honestly um, as possible up until that point, then it should be in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like all of those, I don't know what's going, uh, let me start a little further back. Here's what I thought, because I wrestled with that question. Do you put in foreshadowing? And I don't think you do. I don't know what's gonna happen to me tomorrow. And if you showed 35-year-old Jason Siegel to 24-year-old Jason Siegel, I would be unrecognizable. Um, and so I just felt like to foreshadow something that happens a dozen years later is, would be in, inaccurate and, and, and untrue. But if I played really honestly everything that he knew up until that point, then it should leave me in the right spot. So that, that was what I thought. The indicators are there, you know? Right. I think the indicators of that stuff are there since you're a baby. That's my personal opinion. Was, was there a moment during the shoot when you felt um, even though you had the voice and the mannerisms down, you'd listen to the tapes, that you really felt like you had unlocked something? I mean, in terms of the character. Yeah. Well, I felt like I had unlocked something in terms of the story on like the third day. The first day was the first day when Jess, the, the first day we shot was the first day when our characters meet on screen. So you can feel us sniffing each other out. Like you don't, I, none of, I was terrified. Like I was actively terrified. Um, it was the first time I had really spoken out loud in front of my contemporaries um, as David Foster Wallace. There, so w one of my big fears was that the way that, a, the way that a body can reject a perfectly good organ, that like no matter how good I did, that people would just see it and be like, nope. <laughs> That's, I'm not, do, not doing it. Yeah, that's a possibility. I'm self-aware enough to know that that's what could have happened. Sure. So I was scared about that. The second day, we shot the climax of the movie. Yeah, we had no budget. Uh, so the first, we meet each other at the house, we say goodbye at the house. So you shoot those right next to each other at the house. Um, but... Uh, the third day when Jesse was just coming at me so hard, what's it like to be famous? What's it like to be famous? His character. Um, I felt like, oh, this is a guy talking to his younger self. It's a guy on one end of the journey looking back at himself a few years earlier, just a few little years saying, hey, I know you think you want to get here so badly, but be careful, I'm here, it's not what you think it is. And that just changed the whole thing, because when someone becomes your younger self, you have a lot more empathy for them, but then you also feel okay to yell at them. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you can, you can hate them in a very, in a visceral way that, like, I couldn't feel like I could hate a stranger, you know, unless they did something actively to my family or something. And <laughs> I'm just saying I could hate a stranger, <laughs> given the right circumstances. Um, 
but that, that unlocked the whole rest of the movie. The whole, the whole rest of the time I was able to, like you f dumb kid, uh, you know, it was yeah. like in the back of my mind. It is an interesting relationship that those two have. Yeah. Uh, the weird petty jealousies that go on both sides, the weird, like you said, the sort of older brother relationship, the neediness. Yeah. When Jesse and I first met, so we met once before we started shooting, um, and we had like a get to know you dinner with me and Jesse and the producers. And they started asking about writing, how'd you get started writing? And I said, uh, this thing that I say sometimes, I said, oh, well, it was by necessity. No one was knocking down my door to play Captain America. <laughs> and then Jesse, without missing a beat, like without missing a microsecond, said, uh, no, but you could probably play the captain of a weaker country. <laughs> <laughs> and thus your passive aggressive relationship was born. Yeah, well, I knew like I was going to be acting with and against a formidable intellect. Do you know? Yeah. And something about Frost Nixon, the idea of that came to me like just we're going to be playing a chess match. And you know what was so cool? So Jesse, I, I believe, is going to be one of my good friends for the rest of my life. Um, we have a really special bond. But we drove to work together every morning. We were staying at the same like residence in hotel motel thing. And so it was freezing cold, negative 15 degrees. Um, the the t polar tundra or something like that it was called. Um, and we... Uh, we drove to work together every morning and rehearsed our scenes on the way to work. We did the scenes we were going to do that day, just so we knew the lines, because it's a lot of talking. And then we acted with slash against each other all day long. And then we would drive home at the end of the day and like talk about the day, talk about basketball, go get, we would go get a donut, and just like <laughs> truly hang out. But it was so intimate. It was such an intimate experience. You know, it, it's interesting, too, because in those scenes, I, I'm thinking specifically of when you guys go to the, there's a scene where they go to the Mall of America, yeah. and then later, Jesse's character goes, let me, let me take you to a nice dinner. I think you've earned this. Yeah, yeah. And it cuts to a scene of them walking out of a McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I kept thinking, like, here's this character who's come from New York who wants this fame so badly. He wants to be the literary it kid, and then here's the literary it kid who just wants to watch like bad TV yeah. and binge on McDonald's and eat junk food. Like he's so steeped in this Americana and it's this weird kind of like country mouse, city mouse thing that goes on with you guys that I just think is so incredibly fascinating. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing because you, I, I think, you know, when you're dealing with some of the stuff we know that um, David Foster Wallace was dealing with, it's your job to manage your feelings on a daily basis and sort of construct your environment so that you feel okay. And I think, and we talk about it a bit in the movie, but in New York, for me, a place like LA, um, those aren't designed to make you feel good about yourself. You're, I mean, I, I live in a similar place, but you're surrounded by billboards reminding you that you are not enough. That's what uh, advertising is. He says it, he says advertising is Creating an anxiety relieved by purchase. <laughs> and if you think about it, that's what's happening. Like, oh man, that dishwasher goes fast. Um, <laughs> think about like what I'd read with that extra time. You know, this is like, everything's fine. And being in a place that reminds you everything's fine, I think is a really valuable thing. Yeah. You know, I moved out of LA, I moved to a town where everything's fine. And it's amazing how quickly you realize that when you're not surrounded by messages telling you that everything is not fine. I, I was just in the country for three days before I came back here and it was interesting because I was staring at trees and I was like, these trees aren't telling me anything but to relax. Right. These trees aren't telling me anything but to stop. Yeah, totally. And then one tree, one tree was like, you should smoke Marlboro Reds. Yeah, how did it go? <laughs> did you? They're delicious. You yeah. Should, if, you, if you're a smoker, really, <laughs> delicious tar flavor. <laughs> uh, before I get to the audience questions, I just want to ask one last thing. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, how, did it, how did it feel after that Sundance premiere? Um, and you know, I'll tell you a story. I don't normally talk about like personal life stuff, but I have a really wonderful uh, girlfriend who is, it's very, uh, it's a new type of personality for me in my life. Um, and we've been dating for a while. And she said to me before I left, she said, do me a favor. And I said, what? She says, I know you. You won't be able to enjoy this later. Enjoy this while it's happening, just promise me. And so when nice stuff started happening, I made sure that I really enjoyed it. I gave myself like two nights of feeling like, yeah, you did it. You did okay. Take a victory lap. Yeah, I, yeah, I had a victory ice cream sundae. <laughs> <laughs> All this talk, by the way, about laps and jogging and healthy towns, I'll tell you something that I do resent about my town. It's very healthy, and they kind of shame you into it. So I bought a bicycle, and I bicycle around my town. I've, I've personally, I think I'm like eight inches too tall for any bicycle, but I'm like driving around this town, and one day I decide, like, oh, I'm doing pretty good at this. I'm going to try to go uphill. So <laughs> you start, you have to, in order to go uphill, you go downhill first. So I went downhill for like, it was so easy to go downhill. And so I went for a really long time. I went for like 40 minutes downhill. <laughs> and so then I decided I'm ready to go home. And I start bicycling uphill, and it's so hard. And I'm like sweating. All I'm thinking about is how stupid the bicycle is. <laughs> and then like a 70-year-old man whizzed by me, and he turned back and he yelled out, use your gears. <laughs> <laughs> so full of wisdom, those old people. <laughs> wisdom and experience. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a couple of your questions here. Are you ready? You yeah, need to limber I love up? That. You good? Oh, and what's that? You need to limber up? No, you I'm good? great. I, I, this is my favorite part, actually. Right. This is where we get to have a conversation. Uh, besides this movie, uh, yeah. of all the works that you've done, which has impacted you the most? Well, the thing that changed my life was Freaks and Geeks. Um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 when I was a kid, I saw something in the Muppets where they said, a bunch of weirdos make a family. And that, hearing that sentence gave me hope. <laughs> and then I got cast on Freaks and Geeks, and honestly, I had the thought of, oh my god, it's happened. We were all a little weird in our own ways. Um, I don't, that doesn't need a qualifier. We're a bunch of weird people. <laughs> and we're, we have the naivety of youth, and we just want it to be great so badly. And it, that was the best experience. It was like, it just felt like a bunch of people who didn't understand how difficult it is and are just going to make it great. And like the reality is we got canceled after 13 episodes, but it didn't change how it felt at the time. Like we felt like right. we were gonna make it great. It was, it, was, it was the best. And then you find out it's hard. You find out that stuff is hard and you get a little less brave, I think. Well, when you have one of those experiences early on, you start thinking it's always gonna be this satisfying. It's always gonna be this great. It's always gonna be this wonderful ensemble that I have, and then you, you know, like you said, you realize it's hard. We walked out of that show thinking, okay, well, on to the next groundbreaking show. And <laughs> then I spent three years out of work, and that's when I started writing. That was a really important thing, too. Judd came to me and he said, listen, you're a weird guy. The only way you're going to make it is if you write your own material. And it was the best advice I ever got. It's like the Albert Brooks model of... Yeah. You know, just if you want to do a certain thing, you better make it, make it happen. Ooh, this is a good one. Oh, I wish I'd thought of this one, damn it. <laughs> uh, if you had the opportunity to ask David Foster Wallace one question, yeah. what would you ask him and why? Yeah, I've thought about this question. Um, I think that what I would do is, if I had that opportunity, 
I would try to experience him more than go in with any particular question. I think that like uh, one of the things this movie is about is um, going in with an agenda, you're only going to be dissatisfied with the result. Um, it's like when I try to imagine what someone's thinking. It's useless. What people are thinking is so much more nuanced than what I am imagining they're thinking. <laughs> it's so much less focused, so much, you know what I mean? It's so yeah. different than what you are expecting. So I think what I would try to do if I could resist the temptation to say what's it like, I think I would try to just uh, interact and experience that, you know? Yeah, share some McDonald's fries with them. Yeah, totally. I think you get to know somebody so much more by spending time with them than you do by um, asking them specific questions you want to know the answer to. Yeah, as a journalist who does a lot of Q&As, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well this has felt like a conversation to me. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Who is your dream co-star, living or dead? Oh, wow. Right? Or dead? <laughs> I, I just have a question. Let me, let me just qualify. This is a real question. Can they be dead while we do the <laughs> right thing? I'm sorry. Excuse us for a second. We're going to set down some ground rules for this question. Uh, that's, the, that's you're not acting question. against a corpse. Yes. OK. But if through some uh, sorcery, let's right. say, yeah. you were able to resurrect any actor uh, yes. and they Got would it. give a performance in their prime. Oh, they're Sans, in their prime. Signs rigor mortis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who would it be? I would. Well, I mean, I'm fascinated by Peter Sellers. He's my idol. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Um, being there blew it open for me because being there, I'd seen Pink Panther um, and I'd seen The Party and I was in love with his performances. And then I saw being there, and I thought, oh, you don't have to define yourself. You can do anything. That was big for me. It's such a great performance, and I feel like I'm, I'm slightly older than a lot of the film critics and film writers and people that are out there. I'm, I'm 72 years old. <laughs> it's a lot of oil to lay. Yeah. But it feels like that's a movie and a performance that's really kind of been forgotten. And it's one of those things that I, I feel I'm constantly reminding mm. younger film writers or younger you know, film fanatics, like, you need to see this movie. It's so quiet and beautiful. It's so, um, you, know, you know what it is? It's so, it's so much control. Yeah. That's the thing I've realized about performing as I've gotten older. Um, you have this idea like, oh, I'm gonna, I'll just get up there and go for it. And the people that you love are the people who have the most control. Like the line comes at the perfect time. Right. Like watch a Norm Macdonald talk show appearance and it's like the line comes at the perfect time. Or, or Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal Lecter or um, Peter Sellers and being there is just utter control. Yeah. It's funny because when you look at Peter Sellers' back catalog, here is this actor who's known for doing comedies. You know, he's known for, for doing very kind of open, very funny, very broad comedies, and then he does this very controlled, dramatic role. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny you would yeah. bring that movie up. Well, I got nothing to say about that. <laughs> 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 Do you, think, uh, do you think Marshall would have read and enjoyed David Foster Wallace? <laughs> thank, whoever wrote this question, thank you. Well, well it's, there's such an interesting poll about Marshall. Marshall is, according to the accomplishments, very smart. <laughs> and yet sometimes will like lose a tuna melt. <laughs> <laughs> so I choose the I choose the answer that yes he would he would enjoy it. Good answer. Very much so. I think he would read it in bed with Lily. <laughs> and she would be holding the dictionary. Uh, putting the bookmark in the footnotes. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yep. Totally. Uh, what was the process in writing Nightmares, oh, and man. how does it compare to acting? Cool. Well, Nightmares is a series of books that I write for kids. Um, uh, like novels, eight years old and up, you know, when you can read, like a chapter book. Um, 
It was the first script I ever wrote when I was 21 years old. When Judd said, um, you're only gonna make it if you write your own material, I went off and I wrote this script called Nightmares, which is about a kid whose mother passes away. His father gets remarried. He starts having very complicated feelings about the stepmother and nightmares about witches eating his toes. Uh, because I had a recurring nightmare about witches eating my toes. <laughs> and I, I did, growing up. It's not a mystery, I don't think, why. Because when you're a baby, adults stand <laughs> over you and say, I'm gonna eat your toes. And they put their, your feet in their mouth. And they don't even think, for a minute, you're a helpless baby. <laughs> so, but anyway. So uh, then one night, uh, his, his little brother gets kidnapped by the witches into the nightmare world. And so Charlie and his three best friends have to venture into the nightmare world, each face their biggest fears uh, along the way. And, um, and that's how they accomplish their dreams. So it, uh, it sat on a shelf. I sold it. I sold it when I was in my early 20s. And then it sat on a shelf for like seven years. And as I became more successful, I started to think about it like, oh, they don't remember that that thing is sitting there. And so I let the time expire, and then I got it back, and I turned it into this series of kids' books. And it was actually really helpful for me in taking this part, as silly as this sounds. Um, like, the central theme of the books is that your nightmares are the gatekeepers to your dreams, that they're not there for no reason, that they're there to challenge you, and facing your nightmares is what allows you to achieve your dreams. And I thought to myself, man, I cannot very well tell 10-year-olds to do what they're afraid of and then not do it myself. I can't think of a better note to end this on than that. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks. That was great.